What is up, everybody, and welcome back to a very special previews and predictions. Spencer FC, thank you for joining me. Jimmy Conrad, thanks for having me. Uh, actually, thanks for having me, because I'm at, in your studio, staying at your house, ahead of this London trip to, for the FIFA 18 capture. Exactly. And the upload event. Yeah. And all the preseason training you want me to do ahead of Wembley Cup. We've got a big game coming up, Jimmy. We've obviously played together a few times, but we're going to get a little bit more practice in before the big game. Yeah, we have to build rapport and trust and understanding. Apparently, you want to employ me and maybe not my more familiar position of center back. Well, I don't know let, if we let, want to give it a little tip. Let's keep that quiet. That <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to edit that part out. Edit that part out. Okay, so coming out of a big international break, yeah. there's some big games Massive. here in England specifically, and that's why I wanted to fly over here to make that happen. Makes sense. Okay, first game first. First game first. Does that make sense? First, first things first. First things first. I can't speak English. It's Manchester City versus Liverpool. Jurgen Klopp versus Pep Guardiola. Now, fun fact for you, Jurgen Klopp has beaten him five out of the ten times they faced each other, which I think is a pretty good record against Pep. Interesting. All things yeah. considered. I'm guessing there's some draws in the other five games, maybe, or not. Yeah, I don't think. I think Klopp has a winning record right, against right, Pep. Right, right, right. Yeah, okay. which, is, which is a big deal. I don't think there's too many managers that can say that. No. And then both teams are undefeated. They have seven points after three games. Liverpool beat Arsenal ahead of the international break, 4-0. Yeah. If you guys remember that, I'm sure you do. And then Manchester City had a 95th-minute winner. Raheem Sterling scored to beat Bournemouth on yeah. the road. Yeah. Good result. So both of them had a lot of momentum going into the break. Yeah. Do they lose that momentum now going into this game? You feel like they had to a little bit. Well, yeah, but I guess they're all in the same boat, right? Like, obviously, the fact they're playing each other as two of the best teams... It should kind of even itself out, and there's obviously. I think they didn't they. They've shared a plane. Have you heard about this? They've, they've, no. they've chartered a plane together to help get their Brazilian players back. Huh. So they had like Jesus Aguero, and then like Coutinho. Uh, there's another Brazilian Liverpool. I'm forgetting, but um, all on the same. Uh, Firmino, For, Firmino, Firmino yeah. yeah, all on the same plane. So they're like in cahoots a little bit, but then obviously it's going to go out the window when they play each other. But yeah, I think. Well, um, well I like to say that Neymar and Dani Alves proved that because they yeah. both. Like, True. figured out a way to get to the same club at PSG. So they're definitely in cahoots, those Brazilians. There you go. There you go. <laughs> There's something there. Uh, speaking of Coutinho, what do you make of his situation? Because his bad back miraculously improved yeah, I mean, when he that's... went to Brazil. I mean, that's a long flight to get your bad back to feel better. And now you got to assimilate him back into the team now that he didn't go to Barcelona. Now, if I was a player and one of his teammates, I wouldn't really begrudge him because Barcelona is Barcelona. Yeah. And you're like, well, that's, that's a bigger club than Liverpool. Let's just call yeah, it of what course, it is. Of I course. mean, it is. It yeah. is. And so I wouldn't... Hold it against him if I had a teammate that had a chance to take another step up. Now, if he was going to a team that was similar or that I thought Liverpool was better than, I'd be like, eh, yeah. what are you doing? You know, you're going to kind of throw it up. But they've been playing pretty well without him. This is the thing. They've brought in the Ox as well. Like, they're pretty, they're pretty packed out in that position. Yeah. Watching that Arsenal game, like, when Yaldum was bossing it against the likes of Aaron Ramsey, obviously C Coutinho is a little bit of a level above some of the other midfielders they've got. And he can play in a number mm -hmm, of positions. Mm -hmm. So I, I, there's obviously still room for him. And they definitely still could use him. But I feel like they could cope without him now. And I think that whole back thing is like a little bit annoying. Everyone knew what was going on. Like, mm -hmm. Usually, when there's a transfer, the, the manager will pour a player out and say, I'm just not going to involve him. But Liverpool didn't want to be seen to be doing that, I think, because they didn't want to sell mm -hmm. him. So they were like, Coutinho maybe fabricated the injury or Liverpool went along with it or whatever. But it's, it happens a lot. It happens a lot. It's a bit of an annoying thing to see. But yeah. Would you have sold Coutinho? They got offered a lot of a money. A lot of money. The, the, the problem is, the minute you accept that deal, everyone knows you've just got 120 odd million. And, and so yeah. everyone you want to buy becomes worth, that's right. worth 40, becomes worth 80. Like, like Dembele in Barcelona. Exactly like Dembele. Yeah. And for example, one of the names that was linked with Liverpool if Coutinho had gone was one of our team's players, Lanzini, mm -hmm. at West Ham. Mm -hmm. So, my opinion, Lanzini, young, he's like 23, 24 years old, probably worth about 30 million, 35 million. If I'm West Ham boss and I've just seen Coutinho sell for 120 million, I'm asking for 60 million. Yeah, for right. Is he worth 60 million? No. But Coutinho and Dembele and Neymar, are they worth the money right. they went for? So it's tricky. I think they did really well to hold on to him. Just like Sanchez at Arsenal, if he remains motivated and does what he can do, he's going to be huge for them. Mm -hmm. But Liverpool, really, let's face it, they, they could have used selling that uh, Coutinho and bought Van Dijk and a couple of defenders. Because that's where they're, that's what I think is going to be the difference against Man City as well. Yeah. So what's your prediction? Well, I think it's going to be tight. I think right now Liverpool have the best attack in the league. Right. But they definitely don't have the best defence. And City's defence is looking better. But Vincent Company is hurt for this game. Surprise, he hurt surprise. his calf again. How many times can you hurt your calf? Like get orthotics. There's got to be something that's I mean, genetically wrong with yeah. him. Because he hurts his calf all the time. Some players are just unlucky. He's a yeah. big guy. I guess he's carrying a lot of weight. But like in terms of a lot of, lot of, lot of heaviness on those calves. But... 
it shouldn't keep happening. I feel sorry for. Him. I think re- really, Vincent Company is only a couple of serious injuries away from having to retire. Yeah, I agree. It, with it you. doesn't. It doesn't. I think on his day, he's the best, one of the best centre backs in the league. Easy, but he's just not not having his day anymore. So um, I'm going to say two two. Yeah, I'm I think I, I could see a draw. I yeah. could see a draw. If it's going to go either way, I reckon City might nick it. But um, I was going to predict one all. So all right, we're on a bit of page. difference. Yeah, that's what's up. Up next, let's talk Everton versus Tottenham Hot Spur. Mm. Or the Spurs, or Spurs, or go. whatever you guys like to call <laughs> over here. Okay, this game's interesting for me because yeah. Everton has played pretty well outside of the the Chelsea loss. Yeah. But that was coming off the back end of a Europa League yeah. game. And that's going to be a problem for them, I think, moving forward as they manage that. They signed a lot of great players, and I think they've done really well in this transfer window. I think one of the winners for me in the transfer well, window. Well, 100%. They lost their best player, but they've... They've doubled the quality of their squad, like in every position. Mm-hmm. Uh, Spurs, on the other hand, they did do some business late in the day, but their squad's still a little bit thin. Um, they've got the Champions League, obviously, to deal with as well, so right. they're gonna have the same challenge. And I feel a little bit like Everton are coming for Spurs this year. Like that's like, they're looking at Spurs, their trajectory over the last sort of mm-hmm. three seasons, and saying we want that. And um, I, in my Premier League predictions, I predicted Spurs to, to get in that top four, which I, I think they probably will. But I, I, I didn't really properly think about or remember the the Wembley factor. Yes, which is going to change things massively. Well, I actually think they're going to be relieved this that this game is on the road. Exactly, they can't win at Wembley. Right, they cannot yeah. win at Wembley. You, you can though. Since we'll, 2012, we'll, you have yeah. more victories at Wembley. <laughs> we'll show them how to win at Wembley. <laughs> That's true. Okay? We uh, should we'll, show we'll, them. We'll show Spurs. No, Spurs fans, take notes about Wembley Cup. Have a watch. But um, no, basically. I think this is going to be a really interesting game. I think Spurs, um, Everton have had a ridiculously tough start. I mean, they've already played, I think, City and Chelsea, mm-hmm. and now they're about to play Spurs, mm-hmm. right? Well, what I think's funny about Spurs is Harry Kane has not scored in August, like ever, in his whole entire life. Mental. And he didn't do it again this August, but a couple of days after September started, he scored two goals for England against Malta. It's crazy. That's just it? a crazy stat. I think at some point, it becomes self-fulfilling prophecies where he hears these stats about him and it gets in his head and then suddenly he's like, oh, it's not August anymore. Plays with a bit more freedom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got his goals. But I'm a big <laughs> fan of stats, right? And I, I love them, but sometimes they get overused. Yeah. But there's some stats you just can't ignore. Like that, it tells me something about his training, in my opinion, or something about his his, his off-season. Mm-hmm. Maybe he goes a certain, it takes him a month to get kicking. Right. And there's a really interesting stat. I don't know how, how, if it's continued the last few years, but I remember there was a point in time where Cesc Fabregas at um, Arsenal... And at Barcelona had had unbelievable stats for the first few months of the season up to Christmas, mm-hmm. like leading assists in the league, like almost touching the record for the whole season in assists one year in the Premier League, smashing it with goals at Barcelona. And then after Christmas, he completely tails off. And it was like for five or six seasons, exactly the same, like going huh. from having fifteen assists pre-Christmas to right. three the rest of the season. Yeah, and it's like that. It's... That makes me. And then, and that was that was both playing for Arsenal when he didn't have a Christmas break and playing for Barcelona when he did have a Christmas break. So. He, can you blame it on that? Or is it something mentally with him, like after Christmas? Maybe or he just he, tires. He just likes a lot of chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very yeah. nice at That's no, something he would do I think Ozil's well. got a similar yeah, thing, yeah, but because yeah. he had an amazing season a couple of years ago in Sis. He was, looked like he was going to yeah, get the record yeah. for assists, and, and then, then he just, just tailed off. Yeah. But yeah, I think you're right. It could be a tiredness thing. But it, it, was, it could be. I mean, Wayne Rooney's been a driving force for Everton when he's not drinking and driving. You like uh, what I did there? You like that? And then Deli Ali could flip a game on his head yeah. or flip off the referee. <laughs> <laughs> Full yeah. of puns. Okay, prediction for me. Mm. I could see another draw as well. Mm. Yeah, I'm going to say 1 1. Yeah. It's going to be tight. It's, it's going to be tight. tight. And next up, it's Leicester City versus Chelsea. And this one is interesting for me because it seems like, you know, I'm going to emphasize seems, like Chelsea is morphing into Leicester City. Because <laughs> first, they hired an Italian manager. Yeah. And Leicester did that. Then they signed Conte. Leicester did that. Then they won the league. Yeah. Which Leicester did as well. And then now... Chelsea did it first, though. <laughs> that's true. We, we can forget that part. Let's start the recent edition, right? Post-Conte. And, yeah, then, yeah, yeah. and then they're having trouble with their striker, right? Diego Costa and then uh, Uloa. Is that yeah. how you say it? Yeah, Uchoa. Uchoa. Yeah, yeah, Uchoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uchoa. Uloa. I don't know why I added L's instead oh, of no, it, it's spelt with L's. It's really weird. Oh, but it's, it's, it's U-L-L-O-A. I'm not good at pronouncing it. I only names. know that from the commentators. And then they got drink water in midfield. Yeah, exactly. Just like Leicester did. So maybe Conte should be worried. Maybe getting sacked midway through the season. Well, uh, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Because most of their players, most of Chelsea's players actually did quite well in the international break. Eden Hazard scored for Belgium, so they're in great form. Leicester City, you just kind of don't know on the day. Sometimes they're up for it and sometimes they're not. They've, uh, they've, st- they've still got a spark of, of that magic that made them win the league in there and it comes out every now and then. Yeah. But um, they've lost a driving force behind it now, both of them. You know, the, the, their set of mid-partnership, the, league they, the year they won the league, was Kante and Drinkwater. Yeah. Both at Chelsea. Don't know how much Drinkwater is going to play. 
I think he'll get games across the competitions that Chelsea are involved right. in. But was it, will he be a starter in the That's Premier League? That's an interesting signing for me. Was it just because they wanted to get a, they want to get an English name in there? Like they needed an English Maybe. player to fulfill some requirements. Maybe I think uh, that's probably part of it. I think they they panicked a little bit that they hadn't, hadn't done enough business. Mm-hmm. You know they bought Bakayoko, they lost Matic. You know they bought uh, Morata, they kind of lost Diego Costa. They weren't really adding depth. They got Rudiger, they lost Terry, uh, they lost Ake. They got other defenders mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. you know Zappa Costa on the on the final day, and then obviously drink water. As a Chelsea fan, are you buzzing about those signings? Yeah. Like, I'm sure they'll be fine. I don't think Drinkwater is going to let anyone down in there. And sometimes you need the unglamorous players. You know, they get they get the job done. He's got really good stats, like in terms of passing percentage and whatnot. But yeah, it would be great if they did play Kante and Drinkwater together against Leicester. I'd love to see that. <laughs> um, Jamie Vardy came out and said he'd be happy to see them, but they're enemies. That's what he said from now. Wow. He said like, as long as the, once the whistle goes, they're our enemies. That's I'm amazing. Like, I like that. Okay, so how important is Riyad Mahrez? Because ever since he won the PFA award as the best player, he hasn't really done as much. I mean, last season was always going to be a struggle for the whole club, not just yeah, yeah, him. Yeah. Uh, they were never going to match what they had done the year before. But he seems to have disappeared uh, in, in a way. And now that Algeria actually got knocked out of the World Cup for Russia... I don't think he's going to win his African Player of the Year award. You can really just focus on, on Leicester and Leicester only. He's such a key factor to them. And obviously, Conte did a lot of the work to get him the ball in good spots. And then he could spring Vardy or vice versa. He just, without him, his influence, it just seems like it's going to be pretty difficult for them. He's definitely not hit the levels he did in the year they won the league again. He's had moments. He's had a few games here and there, which, to be honest, I think is probably what you can expect from Mahrez forever now right, like the rest right. of, I don't think he actually is in that upper echelon of world class players yeah. um, I think if he went to a bigger club and had better players around him he'd he would come out more but he's not the kind of guy that's going to necessarily win you 10 games a season you know performances he was he was unbelievable that year but everything everything clicked for Leicester a couple right, of seasons ago right. I think that Kante is such a huge loss for them do you think um, do you think if he had gone to Arsenal things would have been different because he Seems like he's one of those players that would have just fit into the Arsenal team and then disappointed, like most of their signings. I mean, <laughs> recent signings. He'd probably be taking the place of like a, a Walcott or someone out on the right, maybe. Who I don't think he'd do any worse than Walcott. Would yeah, have. yeah. Um, I think he'd have been a decent addition, and that's the question, isn't it? He was linked with a lot of clubs, particularly Roma, in the window. Mm-hmm. Is his head been turned? Mm-hmm. Is he going to still hit the same levels he's done before for Leicester? For me, the, the big Leicester uh, addition, which we haven't really seen come through yet, is Iheanacho. He's not yeah, really been played yeah. yet because yeah. Vardy's been scoring. Right. But when they get him in the team regularly and start building it around him a little bit, I think that will add a new dimension to them because it seems like they had the Leicester title winning season. They lost fragments of it. They tried to replace like for like. They, you know, they tried to get another kind of box to box player when they lost Kante in. You know, they, they're trying to replace and recreate that team. The, the minute they actually accept that's gone and rebuild, I mm-hmm. think we're better for them. Mm-hmm. And long term, Vardy, what's he got? One, two seasons maybe left in him of, mm-hmm. of this sort of level. You know, Nacho's key. You know, Vardy came out and said he's glad that he didn't yeah, join Arsenal because he, he could, could predict see. it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, most people what could a predict legend. it. To be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Vardy just says what most people think, which I like about him. But uh, yeah, I think he, at gonna, the time it was a big decision not to go Arsenal. He's going to be a good pundit when this is all said and done, I think. Yeah. If that's the direction he wants to go. Of True. Course, of course. So, prediction for this one. Uh, I'm going to say another draw. I feel terrible for saying that because it's three in a row now. I've predicted. It's like so safe. It's at Leicester, right? It's at Leicester. I think Chelsea are going to win. All right. I think Chelsea are going to win 2 0. That's bold. I'm going to go for it. I respect that. And last up on our Premier League preview, we're going to do some other games as well from other leagues, but for this, it's Arsenal versus Bournemouth. Mm. Now, you think this would be an easy three points for the Gunners in most seasons, but this season isn't like most seasons. Usually they start off good and then kind of fade towards the end. Or yeah. I guess I, sometimes they flip it where they start slow and then they do really well at the end. It's hard, it's hard to know with Arsenal these days. To be honest, they usually... like. I'm, I'm, I feel very sorry for Arsenal fans at the moment. I think it's a hard time to be an Arsenal fan. If they were to lose or even draw this game, it would be a nightmare. Like oh, It would just kick yeah, off. It, yeah, it would be... Every time they have a bad result now, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. But they usually come out every now and then. Just not, I wouldn't say surprise you because they're a good team, but like they they don't usually lose like five, six games. They, they'll come back for a few games and then they drop again. Right, right. I can't see them not winning this, personally. No, I agree, but they had a 3-3 thriller with Bournemouth last true. season. So. Bournemouth had a really bad start, though. Slow start That's true. The but, but you have that. If you're the core, one of the core players that was part of that game last year, hey, we've done it against Arsenal before. We can compete with these guys. We scored three goals. Uh, yeah, I, I think course. that I think that's a factor, and I've gotten to the point where I think Arsene Wenger is now overcoaching. Like he's overthinking so much yeah. that now that maybe the back three isn't working as much, does he go to a back four? Does he even trust his defenders anymore? They're all over the place. I mean, a lot of the players don't seem like they want to be there. Who who, uh, who am I to say 
tell Wenger what to do. Like, obviously, he's a legend of the game, but for me, he's made some glaring errors this year. The five at the back, or the three at the back, the three centre-backs started to work, right? And it helped him beat Chelsea in the FA Cup, Community Shield, all these different things. So he started to believe in it, and he has the players for it. Mm -hmm. And then a few re for a few reasons, he didn't have the players for it. Injuries, whatever. So Or he, he tried just to decided fit. to put guys in spots they shouldn't well, have I mean, put. He had, he had Klasinac, the yeah, guy yeah. made for left wing back on right. the bench. He had Monreal. And he puts Bellerin, who's the right footer. On I the left. It's like, it, it, it's like you have those players there. He, he took Klasinac and Lacazette out the starting lineup against Liverpool. Right. Why? I don't know why. Yeah. Uh, for me, if I'm Arsenal right now, at home, I go Giroud, Lacazette up front together. Mm -hmm. okay, let them both play. Big man, little man mm -hmm. could absolutely bang goals in, and go back to a four four two or whatever for a diamond, but but four defenders. Let everyone play in the positions they're used to. You can go back to that five when you've got the players to fit the system. But it wasn't you know you missed Koscielny for a couple of games. Didn't want to play Mustafi because of the transfer mm -hmm. rumors. You like they're the people you need if you're going to play that three centre backs. And Mertesacker doesn't get a look in by the way. He's got his club captain Mertesacker on the bench and he's playing two one game against was it, I think Leicester. He had two left backs a centre back. And then Mertesacker on the bench sitting there. What is the point in him being at the club if he's not going to get used in a three centre back system? Because he's a good, no he's a good leader, maybe. I mean, there's clearly I mean, something he, there. I maybe, mean, maybe he doesn't care about playing anymore. That that could be part of it. Yeah, it's frustrating. Uh, I feel bad for Arsenal fans as well, even though I secretly delight in their suffering because their expectations for me are way too high. Like, I, uh, for that, I for them think... to look at their team and like we're going to win the league. Yeah, so is, no, is, you're right. If they look at their team, they're, they're stupid if they think they, they're going to compete, right? But they, they should have high expectations because their club is huge and, they're, and they've that's got fair. unlimited resources, essentially. Yeah, yeah. So and they, they don't the, use them. The, the, what, the problem with Arsenal fans is that they are... Uh, this is changing every day for the better, but for a long time, they've been blind to people running their club, how bad they are. They just don't know how to run a football team. It's really simple. You and I could go and run Arsenal better, <laughs> fact. Because they don't run it to, to win football matches. Yeah, right. So um, yeah, they, they're kind of yeah. round to that, though. Arsenal right. fans are wising up, and I think we're only a few bad results away from just a complete rebellion. And you're always going to have people turning up at the games because it's like it's become that sort of middle class. Like you've got a lot of guys who don't really care; they just go to the game right. for the status symbol. But you'll start to see riots. You'll start to see protests. It's going to kick off. It's going to be horrible, but also <laughs> enjoyable. <laughs> Yeah, I can't. This would be really early to see a Wenger out playing uh, this early. In oh, this if season. they lose to Bournemouth, it'll, it'll be <laughs> next, next game. I'll be back. Well, another fun fact about this game is Alexis Sanchez. He's gotten some criticism from a former coach uh, in Chile saying he's too fat, he looks unfit, doesn't look interested, and then Chilean fans are saying that he needs to break up with his girlfriend. I didn't even know he had a girlfriend. I thought he just was in love with his dog. Exactly. <laughs> uh, that, that she's throwing him off his game. She's like the Yoko Ono of this whole situation. Wow. It's all her fault. <laughs> it's all. And then you have Mesut Ozil who came out and criticized some of the legends yeah. of Arsenal because they weren't acting like legends, in his yeah. opinion. And they're yeah. like, what do you mean? Ian Wright came out and said, why don't you just put your money where your mouth is and actually sign with the club, you know, if you really love the club that much. So that's uh, there's a lot of stuff brewing and usually you just see it with Wenger, but now it's starting to happen with the players. And, yeah, that was your thing that annoyed me a little bit. I thought it was quite nice that he made that message, and I thought that it showed like a, a willingness to to uh, it takes responsibility. Open the yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, but I wouldn't say he really did. That's, That's true. the thing. It's like for me, if I was an Arsenal fan, I watched that. If there's a certain message he could have sent that would have made me go, "Let's go, let's do this message," he could have said, "Guys." I know, you don't, I know a lot of you don't like the way I play. I know a lot of you think I'm, I'm lethargic and I'm whatever. I don't run around on the pitch as much as you want me to. He could have said, that's not my game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he could have said, that's not my game. That's what you get from Sanchez. I don't do that. Right. He said, I personally believe I'm more effective on the football pitch playing this way. Sometimes it doesn't work, but this is the best way. But I appreciate what you're saying. I want you to, I want you to like be in love with me as a player again. I want you to be, be happy with our club. So I'm going to be that guy for you for a few games. I'm going to run my socks off and I'm going to make sure we win the game. I know that that's not the most effective way of using Ozil, but why can't he show the fans that? Why can't he say, I care just as much as Sanchez does, and I'm going to be that guy? That would be the longest Instagram post of all time. He did it. It was like five swipes. It was five swipes. So if I saw that, I'd have been like, you know what, Ozil, fair play. You, you took it, you, you're, going to, you're going to do what you need to do. But, and also, like, I think the legends are being legends. Like, I think it was, I can't remember who it was, maybe Lee Dixon, who came back and said, we are now ex-pros who are now paid to give our opinion. Mm -hmm. on TV you want us to not be critical of our club because we used to play for them look at someone like Gary Neville right. he's more than happy to if he needs to criticise Man United mm -hmm. because he knows that's what they need to hear mm -hmm. he's obviously still a Man United fan right. but you've got, you've got to be critical and Ozil trying to shut them up is seems the wrong, the wrong way to go about it in my opinion yeah I think his heart was in the right place I don't know if he properly executed 
Yeah, I think he wants to get the support going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. get positivity back. Listen, I care. I just want to let you know that I care, and and what I'm doing matters to me. Because sometimes it doesn't look like he cares. But he doesn't care enough to sign the contract, though. Well, then, yeah, that's that's a conversation. (laughs) So, prediction: you got Arsenal to win. I think Arsenal are going to win three 0 I'm going to say two one. I think it's going to be a little dicey, but they'll score late to win. Let's see. All right, Spencer. Let's go to a different country. Maybe Mm -hmm. one you're familiar with. I don't know if you've traveled there before or not. Italy. I have been there. You've been there. I went to the uh, the Milan derby once. Oh, me too. Decent. Oh, decent I remember I watched that video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's good. good. It's good. San Siro is cool. San Siro is very cool. But yeah. we're not talking about a game in the San Siro. The biggest game for us is Lazio versus AC Milan. It's going to be in Rome. Nice. Uh, interesting game because AC Milan has spent a gajillion dollars. They've won every game they've played in this season. They've scored 12 in all competitions and only given up one, which proves that money can buy happiness. For yeah. now, temporarily at least. Well, that's interesting because they've spent a lot of money, but I wouldn't say they paid over the odds for anyone. They got some good deals. Yeah, they did. Like, Benucci in particular. I mean, uh, 40 million euros for him is a steal. If he was going to an English club, it would have been 60 million. Yeah, easy. 100%. Easy. Uh, people like Channel Oglu, Rodriguez, they picked up for reasonably low fees. What's amazing about that, that stat you said there about the money conceding one goal, is their whole defence is new. Yeah. And like, as a defender, yeah. surely you'll know when you get this many players, it's hard to gel, but particularly a defence, like, the. You get better the more you play with each other. You learn each other's, you know, you've got to practice your line, all those things. They've had uh, only a few months to work together, these guys. Right. And I they're think keeping ma- clean sheets. And I think making those signings early helped because yeah. you get them in. And then you have one of the best young goalkeepers uh, in the world in Donnarumma who ended up staying. So that has all been put to bed. And, yeah. But yes, they have a good team. And what I would add is of the four goals they've scored in the league so far out of five, uh, two of them have been not new signings Suso and Catrone, who's come from their youth. So, Interesting. Yes. So it's pretty cool uh, for them to kind of have that balance of players that have been around yeah. versus all the guys that they've signed. I mean, their team before was like, it was okay, but it wasn't the AC Milan of old that of we, know, we know about. But now, I would say paper, bang average. Yeah. But now, and their team now isn't like Juve level, in my opinion, but it's what they need to get to the next step. They need to get back in the Champions League and then they can attract the big names. I was surprised they didn't go for a bigger name up top. I mean, Andre Silva yeah. from Porto is good and he's a good young player. I just don't know if he's ready to be the the guy yet to, to take on all the responsibility to lead the front lines for AC Milan. I mean, Aubameyang was out there. They were linked with Diego uh, Costa. Diego Costa. That would have been great. Great that. Oh, in that team, that would have been amazing. <laughs> amazing. I really feel like then they're pushing on maybe to win the Europa League and even to challenge for the Scudetto. Yeah. Uh, Lazio, on the other hand, they won the Supercoppa uh, yeah. Italia, Supercoppa Italia versus Juventus. So that was a great start for them. Didn't get off to the best start. I think they either lost a spall or tied spall, but then scored late. Uh, against Kievo last weekend. Oh, no, they, they tied Spall. Spall's a newly promoted team, yeah, one of my yeah. new favorites in Italy. Right nine. It is. Very, very good. So they have four points. They're still undefeated, but they don't seem to be the Lazio of old. Uh, Biglia did sign yeah, with I mean, AC Milan. AC. So they, they need, that's a good thing about AC. They bought a lot of people from other Serie A clubs. Yeah. They weakened. They've got Kessi, they've got Bonucci, Conti, all these guys from, yeah, yeah, right. from rivals. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting game. I'm curious to see, because this seems like the real, or the first real challenge. For Milan uh, in this early part of the season, and Lazio yeah. already proved it by beating Juve to start the season. I, I honestly don't want to say a draw again. I, I don't. I feel like I'm. It's. I want to like just pick a side already. Uh, but I'm gonna say draw. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna say. Uh, I'll say one one. One one. All right. Fair enough. Uh, I like Immobile at Lazio. I like him. Yes, I'm he's good. He's good. He's. I'm going to just go out there and I'm going to go 1-0 Lazio. Oh. Controversial, I know, but I feel like this AC, it's too good to be true that AC just go in this whole new team, all new players, and just don't concede goals and just smash it for weeks and weeks and weeks. I feel like they have a blip at some point. I could be wrong, but I'm going to go Lazio. Okay, Spencer, so we're done with Italy. That was really the only game of note. Of course, all the Serie A fans are like, no, there's this game and that game and this game. We're going to go to Spain instead. And this time it's Valencia versus Atletico Madrid, but we're not going to talk about it. We're going to throw it over to previews and predictions correspondent Adrian from Abona TV. So take it away, Adrian. Griezmann called the referee a bottler, so he's still unavailable. But luckily for Atletico Madrid, they are undefeated in their last 13 away matches. Impressive. What's more, they've won the last four matches against Valencia, outscoring them 10-3, to with the last time they lost to them coming in October of 2014. Valencia, on the other hand, got a massive point away to Real Madrid and have improved their midfield with Condogbia in the middle of the park and Gonzalo Guedes on the wing. His speed could hurt Lucas Hernandez or the yet-to-play-this-season Philippe Luiz. However, the Messiah hasn't exactly been a fortress for them over the past two seasons. They've only managed 14 wins from 38 matches, so considering Atletico is coming into this one hot after a 5-1 crushing of Las Palmas, I think they're going to take this one 2-1. Thank you, Adrian. And now let's just keep it in Spain. Spencer, Barcelona versus Espanyol, the Catalan Derby. Now, Espanyol, who I don't talk about much, 
because there's not a lot to talk about. Sorry, Espanol fans. But the last time they beat Barcelona was in the 2008-2009 season, and Barcelona's won 9 out of 10. Mm. So it doesn't look good. I think we can predict what's going to happen. So let's not even worry about the score at the moment. Let's just talk about Usman or Usman. I always say that wrong. Usman, Dembele, and Paulinho, two of Barcelona's newest signings. I'm really excited to see how they fit into the lineup. Yeah. And Dembele is obviously going to defer to Messi and Suarez. Yeah. So I can kind of see and predict what's going to happen with him. But where does Paulinho fit? Because he seems more like a rough and tumble guy. Not that Barcelona doesn't need that. I mean, is Paulinho in their best team right now? Would you still play him? When you've got Rakitic and Iesta Busquets. I mean, why would you sign him if you weren't going to play him? They, they well, paid they $40 million for him too, which I thought was a lot. He's a lot. He's had a lot of money spent on him, Paulinho. Too much. But I think... Uh, <laughs> I think they wanted him to bolster the squad because they need someone for when, you know, Iniesta's can't play every game anymore. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes they want someone that can do a little bit of a different kind of midfield job to what the, the, the flair of Iniesta. Sure. So I'm not sure about Paulinho, but I think Dembele is just going to assume the role that Neymar's left behind, not, not to the same degree. And I think, I actually don't think it will hurt Messi and Suarez to have someone, like you say, who's happy for them to be still the headlines. Right. Um, the question is, one thing Neymar always did really well when Messi was injured is he stepped up. Yeah, he did. He scored loads of goals. Yeah. And there's this really good stat which shows how many goals he scored when Messi wasn't in the team to when Messi was in the team. Right. And uh, it's a lot more when Messi's not there. Can Dembele do that when Messi misses games, if he misses games? I think he can. He's proven it at Borussia Dortmund that he can take over big games and, and play well. But... Barcelona has a certain aesthetic, a certain style of play, and I don't know if you can just get that if yeah. you've watched them on TV or played with them on FIFA. And they're yeah. like, yeah, I got it. I know how to yeah, play yeah. Barcelona <laughs> plays. I mean, these guys have been doing it for so many years, and age nine all the way up, they just continue to play a certain way. Yeah. I, I mean, he's a talented player. I don't think it's going to take him long, but I don't know if a week and a half or two weeks is enough. So it'll be interesting to see how this game plays out. I think Barcelona is going to win. Yeah. Um, I don't think sure. there's much to predict there, but it'll be interesting to see how Dembele plays and Paulinho if he gets to play. Okay, Spencer, so that was Spain, yeah. and we did Italy, and we did England, and in Germany is Hoffenheim versus Bayern Munich for me, which is uh, one of the better games. Hoffenheim seems to have dropped off a little bit. I think Bayern Munich just has too much firepower, and they stole two of Hoffenheim's best players yeah. in Nicolas Sula and Sebastian Rudy. Rudy. Rudy yeah. So I think, for me, that's an easy one. Bayern Munich's going to win. There's really no interesting things there for me. Yeah, maybe we can talk about it on Weekend and Rewind on Monday. I do want to go to France and talk Nice-Monaco because Nice was a surprise team in Ligue 1 last year. Balotelli scored a bunch of goals. They got themselves in the Champions League. Everything was all rosy. Monaco dropped a ton of players but still seemed to be competing. They won four out of four this season. But Nice is in 17th place. They definitely have not replicated what they were doing last year. And on top of that, uh, they got knocked out of the Champions League group stages, couldn't even qualify for it. Mm. So they're in the Europa League. Very spurs of them to do that. Different conversation. But with this game in particular, there's a lot of storylines. Uh, Monaco is sitting on a treasure chest, almost Arsenal-like treasure chest of money that they can spend in the future. Hopefully they will, unlike Arsenal. Falcao, though, for me, is the is he's really resurrected his career going back to Monaco, a club that he once used to play for. Yeah, I think Monaco, ever since they first their owner first came in and started spending silly money on like Falcao and Hammers, and at that point in time, they were like the rich club in Europe. Ever since then, um, for a number of reasons, one because he went through a very messy divorce. There, <laughs> um, he they've changed their they've changed their principles, right? And it's actually they go much more youth centered. They're bringing some really good players through. And Bappe, they'd only bought the year before. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They made so much money on him. Crazy. They're actually, in my opinion, doing it in more of a, like an almost a, a slightly bigger version of what Ajax do in the Eredivisie. Mm-hmm, they're mm-hmm. sort of aware that their league is limited in that who they can attract and who they can keep. Mm-hmm. So they're going to use the system and use their, their ability to create talent to help the club. So I don't think they will invest a lot more of that money. I think they're going to sit on it, to be honest. They don't need to. They've already picked up Tielemans, one of the most in-demand young yeah. Uh, yeah. European players. They picked up uh, Balde Keita from Lazio, yeah. linked with a lot of big clubs this summer. Those are nice. So, two nice signings. They're very nice. They're yeah. very nice. When you consider the money they got them for and the money they got for the players they sold, it's amazing what Monaco do. They, their soul of their team has been ripped apart. You know, Mendy, Mbappe, Silva. Yeah. I think there's probably more that have left as well. I mean, Fabinho uh, stayed in the end, didn't he? Fabinho, Fabinho stayed. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, and then they have, I can't, uh, Lamar stayed as well. Lamar stayed. And then you have uh, Valerie Germain, who I thought was an interesting piece for them. He scored a bunch of goals. I remember including him in fancy footwork because he had a really good performance, a couple goals under the radar. He ended up leaving 
I think he went to Marseille, mm. which I thought was interesting because he just seemed like a good role player. And since so many guys were leaving, I uh, think he would have uh, stuck and around. At some point, you think they were at one point prepared to lose Lamar. They mm. accepted the bid from Arsenal, I think. And then um, Fabinho, potentially, as well, to maybe PSG or an English club. If they lose all those guys, how can they keep doing it at this level? But I feel like they can. They can yeah, do yeah. it. They, they know what them. they need to do in league up. There is something yeah. about them. But PSG, of course, I think is going to end up winning the league. But I think Monaco is going to be right there. But yeah. At least putting some slight pressure yeah. on them. So I think Monaco wins this game overall. Um, but I'm interested in seeing how Nice does because they do have quality in their team. They have a good manager. Bruce Dortmund tried to steal him and they wouldn't mm. let him go. Um, so there's, there's clear there's some belief in, in what they're doing, but they just got off to a pretty poor start to the season. Yeah, it's going to be tricky for them. Yeah, we'll but. see if Nice is nice this weekend. I'm full of puns today. Okay, Spencer, I've taken up a lot of your time, so I'm going to make this one quick. It probably won't be quick. Let's talk a little MLS action and Liga MA keys a little bit because the Mexican League, I'm sure, is intriguing to you as well, and just North America in general. The big game for me in MLS is NYCFC versus the Portland Timbers. Mm. They're both in second in their respective conferences. Uh, NYCFC is led by David Villa, who is the reigning league MVP. He just got called into the Spanish national team at age 35, which is awesome that he's getting that type of respect based on his performance. For me, it was very exciting to see that his performances in MLS mattered enough yeah. to get called back in. And I wish that Italy would call Sebastian Jovinko in for the same reason, because mm. he's, a, he's a quality player. He's probably one of the best uh, talents we've ever seen in MLS, and he came over at a nice age. He did. So I want to know from you, speaking specifically about MLS, how does that league get more respect? I want to say bigger, um, and I guess that maybe goes hand in hand with the respect, because the more respect you get, maybe you get more eyeballs in from mm. there. Now, for, for as an American speaking, there's a lot of layers to why it's not as big as I'd like it to be, and that's a lot of it due to maybe how the league's set up and also just the competition of other the other top sports leagues in our country. Yeah. It's just, uh, yeah. there's a lot of things drawing our attention, whereas when you go to other countries, it's clear that soccer or football is the number one. Yeah. And you don't have to compete for that that attention. It's 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 on everybody's mind, or at least it's, everybody's aware of it. What, do you have any, you know, how do, how, do, how do we do that? Well, on the last thing you touched on, I think you've got, you've got there's two different things you're talking about there. You're talking about the, the popularity of soccer in the US and where it ranks within the different sports in the US. And you're talking about the popularity of the MLS within football. So it's two different things because, um, yeah. you know, I don't know how you how you uh, you fight the battle on, on US or with the other sports because, for me, football is so much more entertaining than those sports. Mm-hmm. I like them. Yeah, yeah. But, um over in this side of the pond, you know, it's just football for us. Yeah, like, right, we right. love it. It's so obvious that it's the best sport. But then every, I'm sure football fans, uh, American football fans and basketball fans feel the same about their sports. Um, in general, Americans have a bad relationship in general with, with kicking things. Mm-hmm. They like using their hands. <laughs> I feel like maybe, I know a lot of people play soccer from a young age. Yeah, yeah. But like, I did a video with some American guys the other day and they just couldn't kick the ball very well. <laughs> it's like, it's so basic to us. And I, if I go and play rugby or have a bit of American football um, play and I do a bit of kicking, they're always really impressed. They're yeah. like, you're kicking so good. And I'm like, it's really basic. Like, because they just don't do it. But they're so yeah. good with their hands. That's right. why Americans make great goalkeepers. <laughs> Keller, Friedel, Howard. Yeah. Great hand-eye coordination. So that's your battle for the US. In football, globally, I think that it's hard because of where you are, like geographically. But I think if you can find a way of, of, of kind of getting involved in different tournaments, like on a big scale, yeah. in the same way that Australia now compete in the Asian confederation football um, qualification yeah, and stuff because right. they wanted better competition mm-hmm. if there's some way where you can get some sne- some clubs can get some invites to the Europa League somehow yeah. it, would be a, it would be a geographical nightmare logistically but like that's going to really give you the opportunity to compare yourselves to these European clubs I, I would say I'm going to jump in on that point because I heard the Copa Libertadores is a massive competition yeah that's competition, probably more realistic yeah and I heard they're trying to combine the two so that right. we could somehow have an American Champions League between both Americas That'd North and awesome. South and then the winner of that would play the winner of the Champions League nice. in Europe. Or you could figure out a way to get the African Cup of Nations. I mean, they have the FIFA Club World Cup. Yeah. But maybe trying to figure out a way to make that even more competitive in some ways. I think that would be good. It would be good. But as you say, the logistics would be a nightmare. Because if you're playing Boca Juniors or whatever in Argentina, to get down to Buenos Aires for most MLS clubs would take tw- 10 to 12 hours. Yeah. That's a... I mean, I don't even know how you figure out the scheduling for that, even if it's a midweek game. Yeah. But I know that those clubs and every other club around the world want to have more of the market share in the U.S. So we have a big growth market in our country and a lot of eyeballs. So I think you're right. It's hard because, as you mentioned, MLS is not only competing for eyeballs with our own American sports. Yeah. Now we have to be competing against clubs from all over the world. So there's a lot of fans in our country that support an MLS club. 
a European club yeah. more often than not, and then they support the U.S. men's national. Well, team. I was at the All Star game recently in Chicago, yeah. and one of the things I found is um, just walking around and talking to people in, in Chicago and people that were football fans. They, they watch my videos and stuff, so they're into football. I'd say like, oh, who's your team? Who's your team? And it's always Real Madrid, Barcelona, or an English club. <laughs> yeah. None of them ever supported Chicago Fire. I, I was like, have you ever been to a Chicago Fire game? No. Yeah. They're going to the All Star game, but they've never been to their local club. It's, it's, and that's uh, that's a problem. Like it's got, a problem. It's because even these guys that you've already got invested in football, they don't want to watch their local team. They want to watch the best football teams the other side of the. You've got to find a local team. I think that's uh, you have to support your local team. Yeah. No matter how big or small that they are, I, th- I think what's what what kills me about these. People in particular is that they're like, well, we, we love our national team. Well, I'm like, if you really love our national team, then you have to support local American soccer. Yeah. No matter how how much I don't know respect you have for that level, uh, and maybe it doesn't compete with Barcelona or Real Madrid, but most most clubs around the world don't. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about maybe the ten super clubs that everybody you know has an idea about and people talk about but you have to get out there and support your local team i think on the playing side as well you need more giovinkos yeah you need more people to come in at that age smash it yeah and people and be like actually i want my player my favorite player from my old club plays in the mls now i'm gonna go watch him there watch him on tv so, i mean we, we have it all in england now a few years ago we didn't but you can right. watch all the mls games now and um the other thing i think is your academies i think the more young people you can come through the only one i can think of uh, recent years is it, well, obviously you've got people like Pulisic over in Germany but yeah. someone like DeAndre Yedlin mm-hmm, who came mm-hmm. through and then he's he's not really smashed it but he's started to play for, for English but, but he's, he's holding his own yeah he's right? holding we, his we own we have Jeff Cameron at Stoke as well of who, course yeah. you know we have some guys that just you don't look at them and think oh man there's the American you look at him like this guy's you can what I think you need is, is these young guys not to just as soon as they get good get snapped up by a European club or as much as that's good for their own development, yeah. you want some people coming through an academy, coming through a, the Seattle Sounders Academy, right. going through the New York Rebels yeah. Academy, that shows their academy is producing quality, which is then only going to permeate into the league. Some of them won't make the switch over to Europe. Yeah. The ones that stay should be at a certain level because they're playing with better players right. from a young age. Right. You just need to be more competitive. But yeah, ultimately, until they prove, the All-Star game is the only really thing they've got right now to compare it. And that's just a glorified friendly it's just, anyway. and it, well, while I was there and the, the best Real Madrid players didn't come on for the last, till the last 10 minutes yeah, and when they yeah. did it was worlds apart I'll also add this that we have a tough time as an American culture and the mentality to let go of our best players like we don't understand why would we sell our best guys like it's really foreign concept to us we have the best sports league we have NFL yeah. we have baseball uh, hockey everything the best of everything NBA everything is in our country so I don't they just don't can't comprehend that it's okay to sell players sometimes and then we can maybe get them back later on or whatever it may be. And now it's just, it's really interesting. We're, we're kind of fighting our mentality in some capacity. You don't really have huge transfer fees in the MLS either. It's like you could sell a guy to Newcastle for 20 million, but then most of the guys that you end up picking up, uh, particularly from abroad, are usually on big wages and not coming for big transfer fees, right. particularly when they're older. Right. It's usually a release clause or whatever. So it's like they're, they're finishing that. They're finishing well, their our, our season schedule isn't on the same yeah, exactly. FIFA calendar either. So you're really never part of that dramatic yeah. and soap opera that is known as the transfer window. And I think that hurts us to not be like a, a player in that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I think we could talk on and on about yeah, this. Yeah, exactly. Spencer FC, everybody, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, everybody. Uh, that watches and supports me and, of course, Spencer. And then go buy his book. Hey. I heard I'm in this. You are, mate. You're yeah. in there a couple of times, actually. That's amazing. Decent. Decent. Yeah. How much do I owe you for that? Nothing. It's all free, mate. It's all free. It's free all free. Just make sure you play well in the Wembley Cup. <laughs> That's a deal. That's <laughs> right, a deal. Good. And then if you guys are in London, we're going to try to do a pickup game. We're trying to figure out when the best time that is. We're really busy, though. we got the upload event. And then we got the FIFA 18 game capture. So watch out for a lot of those videos on both Where, of our channels. When, when is this video going out? Today. Okay, so... If you want to come and see Jimmy play football live in flesh, oh no! Tuesday, Tuesday night, yeah, Tuesday yeah. night, we are playing a club called Beaconsfield. Uh, Where is oh, that? Oh, it's um, it's like in, it's like just not far from London. Okay, it's like, it's like not not. Are we playing out. them there? Or are we? We're playing them there in okay. their stadium. It's to raise money for a guy who I used to play football with who, who passed away sadly. Um, I'm going to be there. Jimmy's going to be playing with Hashtag United. If you want to come down and see the American legend himself play, I'll give you a link you can put in the description. I'll put it in the description. That is a, sure. that's, I mean, that's the ultimate pickup game. You might not be able to play in the game, but you can watch. That's true. That's fair. Now I feel like there's a lot of pressure. Thanks, Spencer. I'm saying, you've got. that's why you mentioned the book. You've got to repay in performances. That's it. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Later. Later.